On behalf of Mr. Kerry Stokes, Chairman of the Council of the Australian War Memorial, and the Director, the Honourable Dr. Brendan Nelson, and staff, thank you for joining us this morning. Anzac Day is the day Australians remember the landing on Gallipoli in 1915. The spirit of Anzac, with its human qualities of courage, mateship, and sacrifice, continue to bring meaning and relevance to our sense of national character and identity. On this day, we reflect upon and pay tribute to the service of our veterans in ceremonies in cities, towns, and remote areas across the nation and in a number of locations overseas. Here at the Australian War Memorial, we come together for Australia's national ceremony of commemoration. The memorial would like to acknowledge the dignitaries who are joining us on the dais. We also welcome the veterans who have served, those who are still serving, their families who love and support them, and the thousands of visitors who have joined us here today. Mustafa Kemal Ataturk commanded the Turkish 19th Division and the Anafata Group during the Gallipoli Campaign of 1915. Subsequently, he became the founding president of the Republic of Turkey in 1923. In 1934, President Ataturk delivered a message of reconciliation to visitors from Australia, New Zealand and Great Britain. The Chief of Staff of the Turkish Naval Forces, Vice Admiral Adnan Özbal, will now deliver that same message, which will be followed by the English translation. Thank you, Vice Admiral Özbal. Bu memleketin toprakları üzerinde kanlarını döken kahramanlar. Burada bir dost vatanın toprağındasınız. Huzur ve sükun içinde uyuyunuz. Sizler Mehmetçiklerle yan yana koyun koyunasınız. Uzak diyarlardan evlatlarını harbe gönderen analar. Gözyaşlarınızı dindiriniz. Evlatlarınız bizim bağrımızdadır. Huzur içindedirler ve huzur içinde rahat uyuyacaklardır. Onlar bu toprakta canlarını verdikten sonra artık bizim evlatlarımız olmuşlardır. Those heroes that shed their blood and lost their lives. We are now lying in the soil of a friendly country. Therefore, rest in peace. There is no difference between the Johnnies and the Mehmet to us, where they lie side by side here in this country of ours. You, the mothers who sent their sons from faraway countries, wipe away your tears. Your sons are now lying in our bosom and are in peace. After having lost their lives on this land, they have become our sons as well. Thank you. Ataturk's moving words, today inscribed on the Turkish monument at Aribanu on the northern headland of Anzac Cove, have long provided comfort to the bereaved families of those who fell at Gallipoli. In all, more than 130,000 lives were lost during the Gallipoli campaign. Soldiers from Australia, New Zealand, United Kingdom, France, India, and Turkey, with most of these soldiers buried on the Gallipoli Peninsula. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Guard of Honor, mounted by the Australian Defence Force Academy and the band of the Royal Military College, Duntroon.
Mr. Kerry Stokes, the Chairman of the Council of the Australian War Memorial, Ms. Christine Simpson Stokes, the Director, the Honourable Dr. Brendan Nelson, and Mrs. Gillian Adamson, will now make their way to the saluting dais to await the arrival of the New Zealand High Commissioner, His Excellency Mr. Chris Steed. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the arrival of the New Zealand High Commissioner, His Excellency, Mr. Chris Seed.
Arriving in just a moment, the Acting Prime Minister of Australia, the Honourable Barnaby Joyce and Mrs. Natalie Joyce. Ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome the Acting Prime Minister of Australia, the Honourable Barnaby Joyce and Mrs Natalie Joyce. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Ha, 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 ha. 
from in front of the Stone of Remembrance, playing the didgeridoo, was leading aircraftman Brodie McIntyre of the Walbury tribe from the central desert of Australia. Leading aircraftman McIntyre is a military working dog handler in the Royal Australian Air Force, currently posted to RAAF base Tyndall. Ladies and gentlemen, the Guard of Honour mounted by the Australian Defence Force Academy and the band of the Royal Military College Duntroon will now leave the parade ground. We now invite the Vice Chief of the Defence Force, Vice Admiral Ray Griggs, to move to the saluting dais for the march past of service and ex-service associations and groups. I would also like to introduce Mr. Richard Cruz to provide today's march commentary.
Thank you, Mike. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today I'm going to provide you with a brief overview of the various units and groups as they march onto the parade ground. The march traditionally starts with the arrival of the riderless horse, with the saddle stripped and the riding boots reversed. This centuries-old tradition of military funerals and memorial ceremonies signifies the return of the warrior's charger from the battlefield. His empty saddle showing that his master has fallen in battle. The horse today is a standard bred gelding called Bill, who is usually ridden as a ride and drive artillery gun horse. His harness and saddlery is appropriate for an officer in Palestine during 1917. The soldier depicts an officer in the uniform of a major of headquarters staff of the Desert Mounted Corps, which was commanded by Lieutenant General Harry Chevelle from 1917 and during the period of the successful charge of Bathsheba. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the parade commander for this morning's march, Mr. Robert Dick, National President of the Return and Services League of Australia. In the unity of Anzac, Mr. Dick is accompanied today by Group Captain Carol Abraham of the Royal New Zealand Air Force. The Youth Flag Party and Bribey Island Community Link led this morning by Mr. Laurie Leonard from Bribe Island. The flag party consists of youth drawn from various Canberra youth organisations, with each carrying an Australian flag. They include scouts, girl guides, boys and girls brigade members. They are joined by 48 young Australians from Bribe Island in Queensland. In a biannual tradition that has carried on for 22 years, the Bribe Island RSL sub-branch Community Link support the students in travelling to Canberra to participate in the march.
please welcome the RSL, ACT, branch and sub-branches of combined Vietnam Veterans ACT members, led by Mr John King, State President, RSL, ACT branch. Formed in 1916, the Returned and Services League of Australia is one of the Australia's oldest and most respected national organisations. The RSL evolved out of concern for the welfare of returned servicemen from the First World War. As such, the Returned Sailors and Soldiers Imperial League of Australia was formed in 1916. The New Zealand contingent conclude, includes veterans from ACT and surrounding areas. The uniformed members in this group are currently serving in Canberra at the High Commission, the Department of Defence, or are undergoing training at various Australian service colleagues, colleges. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Veterans and Services Association, led this morning by Squadron Leader Gary Oakley, National President. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have pr a proud history and have made a significant contribution to protecting Australia and its interests for over 100 years. Coming on to the parade ground now are Land Rovers and Second World War Willie Jeeps, carrying our less mobile veterans. They include a number of Second World War and Korean War veterans. Marking its 90th anniversary this year, the ACT branch of the RSL was formed in 1927. Represented today are ACT RSL sub-branches, Belconnen, Canberra City, Campbell Russell, Gungarlan, Tugranong, Woden Valley, Peacekeepers, Hellenic and Vietnamese. The Hellenic and Vietnamese sub-branches are joined by representatives marching in traditional dress. Today, both past and present members of the New Zealand Defence Force will march in ceremonies across Australia, reflecting our shared history and sacrifice. They embody the links Anzac forged between our two nations on Gallipoli. Second World War, War Royal Australian Navy. Australian sailors and ships served in theatres from the tropic Pacific to the frigid North Atlantic convoys to Russia. As a result, they also took part in almost every major naval battle, from the hunting of the German battleship Bismarck through the Japanese kamikaze attacks in the Philippines and Okinawa. The Army of the Second World War. During the Second World War, the Army fought in the Middle East, Malaya, Singapore, and much closer to home, in Papua and New Guinea, and surrounding islands. Over 30,000 became prisoners during the Second World War. Please welcome the Rats of Tobruk. In 1941, an eight-month siege of the critical North African port of Tobruk by German General Erwin Rommel's Africa Corps commenced. The defenders, who were mainly Australian, lived a terrible existence that led to the Germans calling them rats. They adopted the name with great pride, so that to be a rat of Tobruk became a badge of honour. 
the Royal Australian Air Force of the Second World War, expanding to a strength of 180,000 during the Second World War. The RAAF served with distinction in the United Kingdom, Europe, the Middle East, Italy, North Africa, the Pacific, the Atlantic, Burma, India and New Guinea. Please welcome the Canberra Ex-Service Women's Association, led this morning by Miss Margaret Flett, President. Across the centuries, women have been involved in every conflict Australia has been part of. During the Second World War, women played a vital role in the defence of the nation, serving in the Women's Royal Australian Naval Service, Australian Women's Army Service and Women's, Women's Auxiliary Australian Air Force. Today, service women are an integral part of all three services. All three Australian services fought as part of the United Nations coalition that defended South Korea from the North Korean and Chinese. Between June 1950 and July 1953, they also served in South Korea as part of a peacekeeping force until 1957. The National Malaya and Borneo Veterans Association Australia, led this morning by Mr Rodney Westbury. The association membership is comprised of veterans of the Malay Emergency, Indonesia Confrontation. The emergency existed from 1947 to 1960 to defeat Chen Ping and his communist troops through Malaya and Borneo. Please welcome the Vietnam veterans, led this morning by Wing Commander Ian Thompson. This contingent comprises veterans from the Royal Australian Navy, Australian Army and Royal Australian Air Force, who served in the South Vietnam during the period 1965 to 1973. They represent involvement in all major battles during the Vietnam War in which Australians fought and died. Now moving past, HMAS Sydney escorts and Vietnam Logistics Support Veterans Association, led this morning by Mr Jim Quick. The third HMAS Sydney was an ex-British light aircraft carrier, formerly HMS Terrible. Commissioned into the RAN in December 1948, it was decommissioned following service in the Korean War, only to be recommissioned and converted to a troop and logistics transport ship. Between 1965 and 1972, she completed 25 voyages to Vung Tau during the Vietnam War, conveying troops and equipment, hence the ship's affectionate nickname, the Vung Tau Ferry. Please welcome the HMAS Perth National Association, ACT area, led this morning by former Warrant Officer Peter Everly. Peter served in HMAS Perth during all three of the ship's deployments to Vietnam. The HMAS Perth National Association consists of former and serving officers and sailors who served in one of the three Royal Australian Navy ships named Perth. The first, the six inch gun light cruiser served in the Second World War from 39 until she was sunk by the Japanese in the Battle of the Sunda Strait in 1942. The second was commissioned in 1965 and served for 34 years, including three deployments to Vietnam between 1967 and 1971. The third and current HMAS Perth, commissioned in 2006, is the eighth and final Anzac-class frigate to be built for the Royal Australian Navy. Please welcome the Australian Army Training Team, Vietnam. Led this morning by Major General Adrian Clunis Ross, former Chairman of the Council of the Australian War Memorial and an original team member from 1962. Simply known as the team, the AATTV was formed in 1962 from experienced officers and warrant officers to lead, train and advise South Vietnamese troops and parliamentary groups during the year. They operated individually in pairs or in small groups, frequently facing considerable risk in unusual circumstances.
please welcome the Reconnaissance Squadron Association. The detachment of 131 Divisional Locating Battery, Royal Australian Artillery. Those marching today served in Vietnam. Please welcome the RANS Association, ACT, led this morning by Miss Rose Randyke, Secretary ACT Branch. This contingent comprises women who served or are still serving in the Royal Australian Navy. Please welcome the Tingira Australian Association, led this morning by Mr Eric Pittman, the Tingira Australia Association keeps the spirit of HMAS Cerebrus and HMAS Luam junior recruits alive through the reuniting of class and shipmates. This is their first march in Canberra. Please welcome the Royal Australian Armoured Corps Association. The Armoured Corps heritage embraces Australian light horse, cavalry, tank, armoured and reconnaissance and personal personnel carrier regiments. The core heritage stretches back to the colonial era with light horse and mounted infantry serving in the Boer War. Please welcome the Royal Australian Engineers Association, led this morning by Major General Peter Day. The contingent is representative engineers posted to the ACT. The Royal Australian Engineer Corps are primarily responsible for combat and logistic support engineering, and also have an input into certain aspects of counter surveillance, nuclear, biological, chemical, chemical defence operations. The engineer responsibilities include construction and maintenance of roads, airfield and helicopter landing zones, construction and demolition of obstacles. Please welcome the Royal Australian Corps of Signals Association. Led this morning by Major General Ian Gordon, AO. The Royal Australian Corps of Signals provides the Australian Army with radio, telephone and data communications, both at home in Australia and when deployed overseas. Today's signalers, signalers use satellite and civilian telephone systems, as well as their own military equipment, from Gallipoli to Afghanistan. Army signalers have served in all major conflicts and a number of United Nations deployments. Next on is the Royal Australian Regiment Association, ACT branch, led this morning by Brigadier Stephen Dunn. The Royal Australian Regiment is a professional infantry regiment of the Australian Army. The regiment has served with dis distinction in the Korean War, the Malayan Emergency, confrontation in Malaysia and Borneo, the Vietnam War, the intervention in East Timor, the First and Second Gulf Wars against Iraq, the war in Afghanistan and current support to Iraq forces. Please welcome the Commando Association, led this morning by Mr. Brian Murphy. The Commando Association representing all past and present members of Commando units including the independent companies and Z special units of the Second World War. Australian Army Aviation Association, led this morning by Major Philip James. In the late 70s, a group of former and currently serving Army aviation personnel 
met at Oakley, the home of the Army Aviation Corps, with the aim of forming a group that would offer both camaraderie and a vehicle to assist those in need. The Australian Army Aviation Association, colloquially known as Four Rays, was formed to work together to assist financially, culturally and socially all members of the serving and ex-serving Army Aviation community. Moving through now is the Royal Australian Army Medical Association, led this morning by Brigadier Georgina Whelan. The Australian Medical Corps was formed in 1903 and has provided a medical service wherever the Australian Army has been committed. The Army Medical Corps was granted the honour of a prefix royal in the 1948 by King George VI in recognition of outstanding service during the Second World War. The Australian Defence Force Nursing, led this morning by Group Captain Paula Ibbotson. Nurses have played a significant part in the care of the ADF members since the formation of the Australian Nursing Service in 1898. They first saw action in the Boer War when the New South Wales and Victorian governments arranged for a detachment of nurses to deploy with the troops to Africa. Since that time, defence nurses have played a significant role in the care and treatment of people affected by war, conflict, natural disaster, illness or injury. The Royal Australian Dental Corps Association, formed in 1943 when dentists separated from the Royal Australian Army Medical Corps. The Dental Corps has served in most operational theatres in which Australia has been involved including many UN operations. The Royal Australian Army Ordnance Corps Association, led this morning by Brigadier Peter Bray. The Royal Australian Army Ordnance Corps can trace its origins to 1902, immediately following the birth of our nation. The Royal Australian Army Electrical and Mechanical Engineers Association, set up to ensure the most efficient use of electrical and mechanical engineering resources. RAMI has served in all the operational theatres in war which Australian forces have been involved since the Second World War. CMF and Army Reserve, led by Major Ian Hawke. The core of the contingent comprises former members of the 3rd Battalion, the Royal New South Wales Regiment, successor to the 3rd Infantry Battalion. The Royal Australian Air Force Association, led this morning by Air Commodore Peter McDermott. Formed in 1921, the association provides advice to veterans, facilitates commemorative events and activity actively preserves RAAF heritage. They are joined today by the Wanderers Branch, led by Wing Commander Gordon Perth. The Wanderers Branch was formed in late 2016 and is made up of former members of the Royal Australian Air Force Air Transportable Telecommunications Unit. The Royal Australian Air Force contingent military aviation was first pioneered during the First World War. During that war, both the armies and navies of all the major combatants operated aircraft. Late in the war, however, when it was realised that aerial fighting was a distinct form of warfare and not just an adjutant to land or sea operations, some nations formed specialist air forces, combining the Royal Naval Air Service and the Royal Flying Corps. Great Britain formed the Royal Air Force in 1918. The four squadrons of Australian Flying Corps remained part of the AIF. However, in 1920, the remnants of the AFC became the Australian Air Corps. This in turn became the Australian Air Force on the 31st of March 1921, and with the King's consent, became the Royal Australian Air Force on the 13th of August 1921. Airfield Defence Association, 
Flight Lieutenant Arthur Doe Gale is bringing them in this morning. RAAF Airfield Defence Guards were initially established on infantry lines to protect RAAF assets and personnel. ADG served in the Second World War and in Vietnam. South African military veterans organization of Australasia. This year, South Africa also remember the 646 lives lost when the SSS Mindy sunk in 1970 in route to France. Please welcome the members of HMAS Canberra. Led this morning, by Commander Scott Finlayson. Commissioned in 2014, HMAS Canberra is the inaugural landing helicopter dock to be commissioned into the Royal Australian Navy Canberra. Along with her sister ship, HMAS Adelaide and HMAS Coles, provides the Australian Defence Force with a highly proficient amphibious capacity. Please welcome members from Army Headquarters, led this morning by Brigadier David Wainwright. Army Headquarters is located within the Russell Precinct here in Canberra. The Headquarters consists of approximately 450 personnel who are located within a number of staff branches. These being Career Management, Army Chaplains, Logistics, Personnel Finance, Land Warfare, Modernisation and Strategic Planning. The contingent is made up of veterans from recent conflicts including Iraq and Afghanistan. The Australian Army currently has members deployed on operations all around the world, including involvement in a number of United Nations missions. Closer to home, Army Headquarters currently has personnel assisting with the recovery efforts associated with the impact of recent Tropical Cyclone Debbie in Queensland. Australian Defence Force Academy Midshipmen and Officer Cadets, led by the ADF A Pipes and Drums, leading the contingent today is the Australian Defence Force Academy Pipes and Drums. It's a unique partnership between the Australian Defence Force and the University of New South Wales. It provides training and education for the future leaders of the Navy, Army and Air Force. Approximately 1,000 Navy Midshipmen and Army and Air Force Officer Cadets are currently enrolled in a three-year training program at ADFA. Please welcome members of Australian Red Cross. It has a proud history of supporting Australian military personnel during wartime. Formed within days of the outbreak of the First World War, the Australian Red Cross raised almost five million pounds for the war effort by war's end. It supplied hospitals, ambulances, nursing staff, and supplemented the services of Navy and Army with Christmas packages and other comforts. Please welcome members of the United States of America, led this morning by Staff Sergeant Long Rolando Perez. This contingent consists of serving Americans posted to Canberra in various capacities such as on exchange, studying at the Australian Service Colleges or detached to the United States Embassy, as well as retired and former military veterans now living in Australia. Please welcome members of the Netherlands contingent. It contains mainly members of the Netherlands Ex-Servicemen and Women's Association, as well as military staff from the Dutch Embassy and Dutch military on working visits. Many Dutch fought alongside Australians during the Second World War.
Following them is a detachment from the French Veterans Affairs in Canberra, led this morning by Mr. Gabriel Garagouis. Although this contingent gets smaller each year, they still march with pride. Those marching today served in Africa, Vietnam and North Africa. Please welcome Polish Ex Servicemen's Association Australia. This contingent consists of Polish Navy, Army and Air Force veterans, most of who served during the Second World War under British command. Many may be interested to know that the Poles also served in Tobruk alongside our Australian Rats of Tobruk. Following closely behind, the Turkish contingent consists of veterans and relatives of those who served in the Gallipoli campaign in 1915. Turks and Australians served in the UN coalition during the Korean War. Moving on to the parade ground are the Italian Armed Forces Association of Australia. Staff marching include representatives of the Italian Air Force and the Alpini. The Italian Armed Forces have fought since 1814 in countless conflicts and international military operations around the world. Also welcome India. The India contingent includes veterans from the ACT and surrounding area. They are currently serving in Canberra at the High Commission with the Department of Defence or undergoing training at various Australian service colleges. Please welcome the Tonga contingent. This contingent comprises current serving and retired soldiers from His Majesty's Armed Forces, Tonga. Please welcome members from Karens, led this morning by Mr. Saw Andrew Sen. During the invasion of Burma by the Imperial Forces of Japan in 1942, a few ethnic tribes remained loyal to the British and its allies. While the allies were in retreat, countless lives were saved by brave volunteers, mainly from Karen, Kachin and Karenai and Chin, as they formed levies to hold the enemy back. Also, the relatives of all wars. This is the first year a contingent for relatives of those who have served in all wars has been formed. This contingent comprises relatives and family members of those servicemen and women who have served in our naval and military forces. The Australian Naval Cadets, Training Ship Canberra. Training Ship Canberra is a training ship of the Australian Navy Cadets and is located with within HMAS Harmon. TS Canberra was first established in the 1950s and has a strong connection to the Canberra community. TS Canberra supports the local community in a number of ceremonial events throughout the year. Navy cadets gain training and skills in such things as sailing, power boating, canoeing and marksmanship disciplines. Please welcome the regional Army cadet units raised in the early 1990s it operates from the multi-use depot at HMAS Harmon. Cadets range from 12 and a half to 18 years of age. 224 Army Cadet Unit is the only Army Cadet Unit in the canberra Queanbeyan region. Air Cadets, number 315, City of Canberra, Squadron Australian Air Force Cadets. Boasting over 100 cadets, the squadron formed in 1951 
at the old Canberra Courthouse was originally known as 15 Flight Air Training Corps. Sponsored by the RAAF, it offers activities that include flying, field craft and adventure training in order to develop those qualities that encourage cadets to become responsible young adults. In 2001, the unit was renamed 315 Squadron under the organisational change from the Air Training Corps to the present day Australian Air Force Cadets. 315 Squadron re relocated to HMS Harmon in 2005. On opening of the dedicated facility for each of the three services of the Australian Defence Force Cadets. Number 334 Tugranong Squadron. 34 Flight New South Wales Air Training Corps started as a trial flight in 1992 and the first march in the recruits occurred on Monday the 1st of February 1993 at the flight's premises located at the Tugranong Community Centre. Now parading at HMAS Harmon, the squadron has since grown to a strength of almost 140 cadets, making it the third largest Air Force cadet squadron in the country. In 2008, 334 Squadron will celebrate its 25th anniversary. The Australian Air Force Cadets is a youth orientated organisation that is administered and actively supported by the Royal Australian Air Force. Please welcome the ADFA Band. The ADFA Band was formed in 1986. Today it consists of 40 piece marching band, in addition to several other different ensembles, including bagpipes and drums, string ensemble, jazz group, and singers. The Canberra City Band is one of Australia's oldest and most prestigious concert bands. Formed in 1925, the Canberra City Band provided an entertainment outlet for the workers involved in the construction of Canberra. And now passing us is the Salvation Army Band. For the past number of years, the Tugranong Salvation Army Band has been involved with the Anzac Day March here at the Australian War Memorial. Moving on to the parade ground now is the Canberra Highland Society and Burns Club Pipes Band. Now in their 80th year, the band was originally formed in 1937 as a way to pr promote and maintain a bit of Scottish culture in the Canberra community. Following the Second World War, the band regrouped and with the influx of approximately, appropriately sorry, skilled Scottish migrants gave the band an injection of current piping and drumming skills. Please welcome the Marshals. And the last but no means the least important, the Marshals of today's Veterans March, of which a number are ex-service members. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause to the Parade Marshals who have, who have ensured all marching contingents arrive on time, stepped off in the correct order and on the right foot. Could you also show your appreciation to the band of the Royal Military College Duntroon, led this morning by Major David Bird, for their magnificent contribution to this morning's march pass. Ladies and gentlemen, could, you, could I ask you to please keep the applause going in thanks to the many scouts, guides, 
and Girls and Boys Brigade members who assisted with today's march by carrying the name boards in front of each of the marching contingents. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a great privilege to provide today's March commentary on this 102nd anniversary of the Anzac landing at Gallipoli. It's been a wonderful march, and I sincerely thank you. Thank you, Admiral Briggs, for reviewing the march past, and also Richard for your very informative commentary. A special thank you, of course, too, to the many veterans and representatives who've chosen to march here today at the Australian War Memorial, particularly given the conditions. Ladies and gentlemen, the Guard of Honour, mounted by the Australian Defence Force Academy and the band of the Royal Military College Duntroon, will now return to the parade ground.
The Catafalque Party will now be mounted at the Stone of Remembrance. The Catafalque Party, provided by Australia's Federation Guard, consists of a commander and four members. These members represent the Royal Australian Navy, the Australian Army, and the Royal Australian Air Force. Ladies and gentlemen, this year the commemorative address will be delivered by the Vice Chief of the Defence Force, Vice Admiral Ray Griggs. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal people, the traditional owners of the land, of this special place of remembrance for us all, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I also acknowledge elders from other parts of the country who are here today, and Indigenous members of the Australian Defence Force. In telling the Anzac Day story, we understandably gravitate to what happened on the Gallipoli Peninsula 102 years ago. For the last few years, we have focused, quite rightly, on the Great War, and particularly on the Western Front, the carnage, the confusion and the courage that the young nations of Australia and New Zealand's troops were subjected to or displayed. Arguably though, our darkest year was not 100 years ago, but 75. 1942 challenged us more as a nation than any other. A year in which the Anzac story of dealing with adversity is borne out like few others. In the final days of 1941, just three weeks into the Pacific War, Prime Minister John Curtin warned of the supreme tests Australia would face in the year ahead. Evoking the poetry of Bernard O'Dowd, Curtin foreshadowed the arrival on our doorstep 
of the war and posited whether 1942 would bring disaster or a new dawn. All Australia is the stake in this war, he warned. The year started with Britain facing its own darkest hour in its fight against Nazi Germany. Just as Japanese forces were sweeping across Asia, with Hong Kong and the Malay Peninsula falling quickly. Despite valiant Allied efforts of resistance, but lacking control of the sea and of the air, Singapore inevitably fell on the 15th of February. At that moment, 15,000 Australians from the 8th Division were condemned as prisoners of war. Thousands more would die in captivity. Their war as POWs was far from over, but it was to be a very different war from what they expected. Just two days later, 22 Australian Army nurses were brutally massacred at Banker Island, having surrendered along with wounded servicemen and civilian evac evacuees from Singapore. It is hard for us today to understand the st strategic shock that the fall of Singapore gave rise to, how it sapped morale and how it made Australians feel very alone. Just four days later, that point was driven home when 188 Japanese carrier-borne aircraft, many veterans of Pearl Harbor, bombed Darwin, devastating the town and leaving 243 people dead. Among the dead were the first American servicemen killed helping to defend Australia, as the US destroyer Peary was lost, along with 88 of her crew, after sustaining heavy enemy air attack. This was the first of 65 attacks on the Australian mainland throughout 1942, which even included the war coming to Sydney on the night of the 31st of May with the audacious Japanese midget submarine attack. Just a week after Darwin was bombed, Australian morale was struck another blow when the cruiser HMAS Perth and the US cruiser Houston were sunk in a short but vicious and gallant battle in the Sunda Strait. Over 1,000 Australian and US sailors died that night. More than 350 crew members were from the Perth, including Captain Heckwaller, whose death was described in dispatches as a heavy deprivation for the young Navy of Australia. Many others were lost as POWs as the war went on. Days later, there was another heroic loss when Lieutenant Commander Robert Rankin, in command only a few short weeks, turned his hopelessly outgunned sloop HMAS Yarra toward Japanese cruisers and destroyers in a vain attempt to allow the convoy the ship was protecting to scatter. Sadly, the outcome was preordained. The stories of courage, such as Rankin's and leading seaman Buck Taylor, who fired to the last, were not. While the bulk of the Royal Australian Air Force was heavily engaged in the European theatre, our Hudson bombers based in Darwin from 2 and 13 squadrons continued their dangerous missions over Timor. They attacked shipping and bombed Japanese targets in treacherous skies which they did not control. Against this backdrop and with Australian spirits sagging, the Japanese started to expand their defensive perimeter further into the southwest Pacific, and the threat of cutting the lines of communication between Australia and the United States were very real. Forewarned by intelligence of impending Japanese operations, Allied forces deployed the Yorktown and Lexington Carrier Task Forces just northeast of Australia in the Coral Sea. Two Australian ships, the heavy cruiser Australia and the light cruiser Hobart, contributed to the Allied force. As a testament to the gravity of the situation and what Australia had to lose, Prime Minister Curtin rose in Parliament and announced that a great naval battle 
was proceeding in the Southwest Pacific. It may be for many of them the last full measure of their devotion to accomplish the increased safety and security of this territory, he warned. From that moment on, the significance of the Battle of the Coral Sea was cemented in Australian history. The largest naval battle fought so close to home was a tactical loss, but a strategic victory lay in the loss of life and the wreckage of aircraft and ships. It was the first time the Japanese had been halted during their southward advance in the Pacific. From there, the pendulum slowly started to swing, and the outcomes of some very tough battles in the months that followed further boosted Allied morale and momentum. Australians continued to step forward. The 6th and 7th Divisions, who had returned from the Middle East, fought in gruelling conditions on the Kokoda Track and at Milne Bay. And supported by RWF Kitty Hawk pilots, they ended the Japanese campaign to take Port Moresby. In Timor, Sparrow Force tied up a Japanese division for months with their raiding tactics. Across the Southwest Pacific, our coast watchers provided invaluable intelligence. Australia, by year's end, was now more secure and became the launching pad for the long road to victory. 1942 was a pivotal year in the Pacific War. I've only mentioned but a few of the many actions and battles that took place across this vast maritime theatre. Enough, I trust, though, to give a sense of its crucial importance to our nation. It's often said that we came of age at Gallipoli, but I think 1942, it's fair to say, was a year that unified this country like no other, where the war effort became a national imperative. It was a year in which conflict came to our doorstep, a year in which our alliance with the United States was forged. In 1942, it was the collective efforts of the whole nation that allowed the year to end with a new dawn rather than in disaster. The thread that connects our troops at Gallipoli to those in 1942, to those who stand watch today, is the grit, the determination and the will to endure the adversity they face in fighting for our way of life and our freedoms. This fight has always involved great sacrifice and we have not always prevailed. But our troops have always fought in a way that warrants our gratitude, our respect, and most importantly, thoughtful reflection. That's why we gather here every year from dawn and throughout the day. That's why we must remember them always, lest we forget. Admiral Briggs, thank you for those remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the singing of O Valiant Hearts.
Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Wreaths will now be laid in the following order. The Acting Prime Minister of Australia, the Honourable Barnaby Joyce, and the New Zealand High Commissioner, His Excellency Mr Chris Seed. These wreaths are laid together in memory of the significance of ANZAC to Australians and New Zealanders. Representing the Chief Minister of the Australian Capital Territory, Ms. Yvette Berry. Representing the President of the Senate, Senator Sue Lyons, and representing the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Mr. James Catchpole. The Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia, the Honourable Chief Justice Susan Kiefel. Representing the Dean of the Diplomatic Corps, His Excellency Mr. Nabil Lakul.
The British High Commissioner, Her Excellency Mrs. Mena Rawlings, and the Turkish Ambassador, His Excellency Mr. Ahmed Vakur Gokdanizla. Representing the leader of the federal opposition, Ms. Gay Brockman. Representing the Chief of the Defence Force, Vice Admiral Ray Griggs. Chairman of the Council of the Australian War Memorial, Mr Kerry Stokes. And National President of the Returned and Services League of Australia, Mr Robert Dick. Representing the Chief of Navy, Rear Admiral Michael Noonan. Representing the Chief of Army, Major General Rick Burr. And representing the Chief of Air Force, Air Vice Marshal Andrew Douse. National President of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Veterans and Services Association, Squadron Leader Gary Oakley, and accompanying the National President is leading aircraftman Brody McIntyre, today's didgeridoo player. National President of the Naval Association of Australia, Commander Terry Makings, and National President of the Australian Flying Corps and the Royal Australian Air Force Association, Air Vice Marshal Brent Esplund.
National President of the War Widows Guild of Australia, Mrs Meg Green, and National President of the Australian Federation of Totally and Permanently Incapacitated Ex-Servicemen and Women, Ms Pat McCabe. And the final wreaths will be laid by the chairman of Legacy Australia, legatee Anthony Ralph, accompanied by junior legatees, Master Henry Didhams and Miss Melinda Thomas. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the reading of the Creed by the Chairman of the Council of the Australian War Memorial, Mr Kerry Stokes. On the morning of the 25th of April 1915, Australian and New Zealanders landed under fire on Gallipoli. It was then in the battles which followed that the Anzac tradition was formed and the bond with which Australia and New Zealand now live was forged. Today above all days, we remember those who served our nation in times of war and in peace. We remember with pride their courage, their compassion and their comradeship. We remember what they accomplished for Australia and indeed for freedom of mankind. We honour those who died or who were disabled in the tragedy of war. Their stories adorn our nation's history. We grieve the families of the fallen, particularly the war widows and orphans. We recall with pride the selfless service of Australian men and women in places near and far on battlefields, in many lands, on or under the oceans and seas and waterways, and in the skies over many theatres of war and other operations. We remember those who suffered as prisoners of war and those who died in captivity. We remember staunch friends and allies. Those who have served our nation have bequeathed to us a great legacy. May we and generations to come prove worthy of their sacrifice. Please remain standing while we join together to sing the hymn, Abide With Me.
Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing as Mr. Robert Dick, National President of the Returned and Services League of Australia, recites the ode. After the ode, the last post will be sounded, followed by a minute's silence and the rus. This will be followed by the national anthems of New Zealand and Australia. They shall groan of old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. lest we forget.
Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. The catafalque party will now dismount from the Stone of Remembrance. Ladies and gentlemen, in a few moments we will have the pleasure of witnessing a fly past of Royal Australian Air Force Formation fly past consisting of three FA-18 Hornet fighters. Please be aware that these aircraft are particularly noisy. The aircraft are operated by two operational training unit which is based at RAAF Base Williamtown near Newcastle. The unit was formed at Point Piri in South Australia on the 6th of April in 1942 and operated initially with Wirraways and Ferry Battles. The FA-18 Hornets that you will see shortly have formed the core of Australia's air combat capability since the late 1980s. They have been continually upgraded and improved in order to remain highly capable in any theatre of operations that may emerge. The aircraft is designed for air-to-air -air, as well as air-to-surface combat over land or sea, by day or night, in all weathers. It also operates closely with the Australian Army and Naval Forces, as is required in the context of modern warfare. These aircraft form the backbone of Australia's air defence. They regularly train together at home and abroad on exercises with our international allies. The classic FA-18 Hornets that you will see soon will be replaced by the F-35 Lightning, commonly known as the Joint Strike Fighter. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, I remind you that the noise is quite severe as these planes come across our skies very soon. They have made a major and long-lasting contribution to our defence forces over a long period and, as indicated, have served all three branches of the Australian Defence Force. While they are to be replaced shortly, nonetheless, they have provided sterling service for all aspects of Australian defence and have certainly been a wonderful addition to the Air Force fleet. They've served in numerous different operations, as mentioned, not just in terms of exercises locally, but also those further afield. As I said, they are noisy and here they are. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honourable Barnaby Joyce, His Excellency Mr. Chris Seed, Ms. Gay Brotman, Vice Admiral Ray Griggs, Mr. Kerry Stokes, the Honourable Dr. Brendan Nelson and their guests are making their way now into the Hall of Memory to this year lay floral tributes at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier.
The floral tributes that I mentioned a moment ago include small wooden crosses written on by Australian schoolchildren with messages of hope and thanks for those who have served in Australia's name. These crosses are also being placed on the graves of First World War Australian soldiers around the globe. To end the ceremony, please thank the Guard of Honour mounted by the Australian Defence Force Academy and the band of the Royal Military College Dunfroon as they march off the parade ground. Ladies and gentlemen, in thanking, of course, both the band and the Guard of Honour, please also thank the choirs for leading the singing today. We also wish to acknowledge Mr. Russ Simons, who unfortunately was unable to participate as the Master of Ceremonies today in what would have been his 20th Anzac Day at the Australian War Memorial. A reminder too that at 4.55 this afternoon, the last post ceremony in the commemorative arena will conclude the memorial's Anzac Day commemorations of the landings on Gallipoli. You are most welcome to attend. The last post ceremony is also streamed live on the memorial's YouTube channel and Facebook page, which can be accessed via the memorial website address, which is listed in your order of service. Anyone who wishes to lay a wreath or floral tribute at the Stone of Remembrance may do so at the end of the ceremony. The memorial will be opening in approximately 15 minutes and you are encouraged to visit the commemorative area and to pay your own tribute. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending the 2017 Anzac Day National Ceremony here at the Australian War Memorial, Canberra.